so I wanted to um, welcome you on behalf of Day Spring Women's Ministry. And I wanted to welcome you to the Healthy You Conference 2018. It's here. Um, I currently teach um, elementary PE over at Day Spring School. And uh, I am married to an amazing man. And together we are raising three amazing little men. I have a two-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 10-year-old. And I grew up in Southern California and moved here with my family uh, right before I started high school. And it was quite a culture shock. And I absolutely hated Missouri. And I swore I was not staying here. I was going back as soon as I had a chance to do it. Um, but, um, you know, eighth grade is kind of an awkward time anyways. And um, it seemed like I was never going to fit in. And I just wanted to escape. Um, but if you... Funny things that I remember um, about first moving here is we didn't have anything like a super Walmart. This was back in the 90s. You know, they have Walmarts there now. But I had never seen anything like as enormous as a super Walmart that had so much <laughs> stuff packed in there, but there was no variety. I couldn't figure out how <laughs> they would get that much in there, but then when you went to go pick something out, it was only one of each thing, so there was just like no variety at all. Um, and I could never, um, I had never actually seen or touched any snow. So that was a big one for me. So, nor had I ever been exposed to any sort of frigid temperatures, <laughs> except like a commercial walk-in freezer or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but the Ozarks, um, they're never unexciting, right? It seems like this last week, I think we had all four seasons, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> like in one week, I, I think so. Um, but in California, you were wearing hats and parkas if it was below 50. You were wondering what was going on. But <clears throat> um, I, another thing that I think is really interesting, and, and I don't even know how I could think this or not know this, but I really did not realize that there were actually cowboys. Like, I had seen them in the movies. <laughs> I thought they were in Wild West movies. I did not know that there were really people that were actually cowboys. And so then when I saw that, I was, I was like, well, I know that there's country music. Because everyone had heard of, like, Garth Brooks and things like that, but... I honestly did not know until I had started school and I saw these people in cowboy boots. I was like, huh, I guess that really is their, like, their life. I guess they really do that thing. <laughs> um, but now I've been here in the Ozarks longer than I was there and um, it's home to me now. And it really has captured my heart. And I wouldn't want to raise my own little cowboys <laughs> anywhere else. Um, so this is my this is my home sweet home now. Um, and I like Aaliyah was saying, I, I do I have a, a passion for the arts and a yearning to see the gifts and talents um, of his people um, to showcase his beauty and splendor. And for that reason, um, I use my background in fashion to produce um, benefit in art uh, fashion and art shows, um, mostly for nonprofit organizations and things like that, but really just because I just love doing it. 
Um, and I and I like that it all goes towards um, charities and things that are near and dear to my heart. And uh, I do, I write a blog over at Dreams of Perfect Design that I started several years ago. Um, I don't post to it nearly as much as I should, but that's just me. And um, I will occasionally do um, a fashion photo shoot to go along with um, some of those posts. Um, we haven't done one in a while, but usually with Melissa Vanderlinden, who was the worship leader um, up here, and she's not here anymore. I, I think she stepped out, but oh, there you are. There you are. So uh, I was just going to brag on her really quick, but <laughs> she honestly wears more hats than any other woman I know. And um, not just like figuratively, but she could put any hat on and it would look good on her. <laughs> any hairstyle, anything, it doesn't matter. You could put a mop on her head and it would look awesome. But she really does. It, it, it's one of those things where um, it's like, well, I don't know how to do that, but Oh, Melissa. Melissa does. <laughs> Melissa knows how to do that. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's a little maddening. I get a little, I get a little jealous sometimes. <laughs> but anyways, um, that was just a little bit about me, and maybe a little tiny snippet about Melissa, about what I enjoy doing. But this conference really is not just about one woman. Um, or some women, or any of the specific speakers you're going to hear tomorrow. Um, this conference is really about you, healthy you. Um, and what is the Holy Spirit telling you about your health? The mission of this conference is to partner with the Holy Spirit um, to provide hope, health, healing, and really to give you the knowledge and the resources and the tools um, and the connections um, among you guys to be the healthiest, uniquely made versions of you. And I truly believe that our health and wellness is inseparable from our purpose and our God-given talents. I don't think that it can be separated. And if we miss that, that one simple truth, and we don't know our identity in Christ, we will always lack the long-term motivation to be a better us. That's always going to be missing. So how did I get involved in something like the Health of You conference? Well, I never really thought much about my health at all, other than I thought, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I, I um, am, was a runner, and I would do long-distance runs, and so I stayed active that way, and I liked doing that. Um, and I didn't think that my, my diet or what I ate was that bad, you know. It wasn't horrid, you know, ever, but it, it, was, um, it wasn't awesome, but it, it, it was pretty decent, what I thought. So I never really thought about that at all until about two years ago. And... Um, I had never suffered um, any major illnesses. Um, but about six months after my last child was born, I was actually getting ready for a fashion and art show. And I was suffering from what I thought were like some seasonal allergies, like I did every year. Um, and so that, that's what I thought I was suffering from. 
um, and my eyes were particularly dry. And then I started noticing like these flickering windmill lights kind of like coming off of the side of my, my peripheral vision. And I was thinking, that's weird. That's not like allergy-like. I better get into my doctor. So I made a trip to my primary care doctor um, and the nurse practitioner, she sent me over to an ophthalmologist which happened to be available the next day, which that doesn't happen very often. But so she sent me over to this ophthalmologist because she said, well, I don't know. She's like, allergies could do that, but I think you better go over and see the ophthalmologist to rule out some other things. So I went and I saw him um, the next day. And um, so I'm going to read to you um, what I spoke on at that Designing a Difference um, fashion show, fashion and art show in November of 2015. So you're going to come with me, and we're taking a trip back in time to that night at the Fox Theater downtown. Chrissy, I remember you sitting right there in the front row. There you are. And um, you've just finished perusing through the art in the back um, for the auction, and you've seen some ballet and some theater and a little bit of improv, and, and now, you're, now you're listening to, to me. So, I'm going to So, a little over two weeks ago, I lost my vision, literally lost my vision. Over the course of about a week, I had significant vision loss in both of my eyes at a very rapid rate, and each morning I woke up, I could see less and less until I was blind in my left eye, only able to make out shadows, light and dark objects and my right eye was nearing the same thing with the um, constant pulsing flickering and the trailing off of lights and my ophthalmologist's expert care compassion and quick referral got me to a retina specialist in jeff city the following day there's another what retina specialist is available the next day after you see an ophthalmologist the next day <laughs> So there I was, um, diagnosed with an extremely rare immune disorder that causes um, super inflammation in the back of your retinas. Um, and it, it leads to um, retina problems, um, vision loss, dizziness, headaches. Um, and since it's so rare, um, researchers really are not exactly sure what even causes it. And I'm currently on a treatment plan, and many prayers have been set up, sent up on my behalf. My doctors and I have seen significant improvement. With the continued prayers of family, friends, and even strangers, I was comforted during a very scary time in my life. I obviously love to read and write, and I couldn't do any of that. In those long, dark, and quiet hours, I prayed a lot. And it changed my perspective on life. And it transformed what I thought were my priorities. And it will forever have an impact on me. And what God revealed to me is that we can make that kind of impact on someone else's life. It's like giving them their sight back. And those that need to see a change in their lives need to see a need filled. And they need to see the value in themselves. And we all have gifts and talents and experiences and memories that no one else possesses. And these are given to us for a reason, for a purpose. And we're all capable of making a difference 
despite our circumstances, our busyness, our trials, and our challenges. And by recognizing the beauty within someone or something that gives value, and that is really how our lives are transformed and changed, is by valuing and honoring them. And my vision, literally and figuratively, was given to me to fulfill a purpose, and it is unlike any other person here on earth. As is yours. Only you can carry out the vision God has given you. I have never been so thankful to be able to see my kids play, read them bedtime stories, marvel at the amazing, just pretend with me here, um, pieces of artwork back there in the auction. Walk out on this stage and see your shining faces smiling back at me. This is God's beauty. And my hope and prayer is that dreams of perfect design would inspire and encourage you in unearthing the artistic beauty from the everyday piles of dirt. And I want to share the very first blog pro post I wrote onto my Hearts in the Arts page titled, Dictionaries and Desert Roses. Do you ever get a tiny hint of something that transports you back to a wonderful memory? A sort of super saturated deja vu. A sort of running cannonball into the deep pool of your five senses. I love those. <laughs> there has been just a few times over the years that I have enjoyed these moments. One such moment occurred a couple of years ago as I was walking up to my door on a clear night with a huge bright moon. A warm dry breeze blew up bringing with it a light floral sandy scent. As soon as the aroma filled my nostrils, I was a kid again. On one of my many family road trips across the US, riding the back seat of my parents' station wagon, windows down, my head resting on the door, I stared at the bulging moon and brilliant stars while my tangled hair whipped in the wind, and my breaths grew sleepy and rhythmic with the hum of the tires of the infinite stretch of highway that sliced the deserts of New Mexico, steeped with cactus blooms and the settling of dust and dew. It's hard to describe the tranquility I enjoyed marveling at the vast moving sky from the passenger side of that 72 Buick beast. And I wished on stars, I talked to God and dreamed up romantic fairy tales, all involving me, of course, and my middle school crush of the week. I relished in the sight of the reflection of the moonlight in my mom's driving glasses and took comfort in watching my dad read road maps over, under the overhead light, even though the pavement wouldn't curve for miles. And my reminiscent moment was fleeting and I found myself inhaling and sniffing in every direction to get just one more memory inducing whiff. There have been others too recently while Roasting marshmallows in the fireplace with my kids, I had an ephemeral rapture back to the childhood bonfires we would have on the beach. I laid belly down on my little mermaid towel, snug in a fuzzy sweatshirt and stared into the flickering flame that reddened my cheeks. I could taste the seashore in my cracked lips. It tasted like building sand castles and searching for hermit crabs and clinging to boogie boards. I'm now blessed with the beauty of the Midwest as my backyard. But still every now and then, God gives me a small taste of beauty from across the nation. I haven't driven through the deserts or felt the sand between my toes in many years, but I am thankful for the brief glimpse of natural beauty and creation, even if they only exist in my head. The natural tends to give us just a tiny peek, a delightful nibble of the supernatural. Our gifts, our callings, our creative pouring, they are compliments to his. They can praise and thank, or crave and ache, or testify and glorify, or influence and question, or even probe and dissect. They are what our eyes see, our ears hear, our lips taste, and our hearts feel. We all stop to smell the flowers in different ways and at different times. 
but the beauty of the flower remains the same. We are naturally tied to creation, naturally intended to create as our best mortal efforts to imitate the creator. I came across an insightful quote that was referenced in a book by Philip Yancey from a chapter titled, God Loveth Adverbs. Lewis Smedes tells in his book, My God and I, about a creator who liked elegant sentences and was offended by dangling modifiers. <laughs> Once you believe this, where can you stop? If the maker of the universe admired words well put together, think of how he must love sound well put together. And if he loved sound thinking, how he must love a Bach concerto. And if he loved a Bach concerto, think of how he prized any human effort to bring a foretaste, be it ever so small, of his kingdom of justice and peace and happiness to the victimized people of this world. In short, I met the maker of the universe who loved the world he made and was dedicated to its redemption. I found the joy of the Lord not in a prayer meeting, but in English Composition 101. So since then, since that night, I have ups and downs. It is a roller coaster of wellness and sickness. Um, a dozen different medical specialists uh, strength gaining and then relapses and just being real here, I, you know, I'm struggling with my own health issues now as we speak. Um, but what God has told me is that regardless of what I'm going through, he is with me always. He never leaves. He never, ever, ever leaves. I think we often view health as a bit of a chore, as something we see as a New Year's resolution, and then we feel like failures when we don't achieve the goals we set. But what we need to constantly remind ourselves is that we all stop and smell the flowers in different ways and at different times, right? But the beauty of the flower is undeniable. We are his creation, and being healthy is not getting to a destination. It's a journey with flowers along the path, but the path doesn't end in a field like it does in the Wizard of Oz. He created us to uniquely fit together like a puzzle. And the journey is what is beautiful. Christ died so I can journey. That's the gift. That's the beauty. I am on a health journey, and you are on a different health journey, but he didn't create us to walk alone or to walk that path alone. He created us to uniquely fit together like a puzzle one piece at a time, helping each other along, but not ever looking exactly the same. The body of Christ. What significance and impact his physical body made here on earth? The body of Christ. his hands and feet, his physical structure, his journey, his presence among the throngs of people. But we too, we are the body of Christ. His hands, 
and feet, we journey. We are physically located here on the earth among throngs of people. What is he telling you tonight about your journey? What is he sharing with you about your physical body, your spiritual body, your mind, the health of your relationships with your friends, families, with your children? Who is he sending down your same path to encourage and come alongside you? Are we blind to what God breathes into us? Because of all the information everyone else is telling us that will bring happiness and health to you in 2018. If we feel like we don't measure up, we are a failure, we'll never get there, then that's not our path. Then you're probably, by then, sitting down, surrounded by all these flowers, like what Leslie was talking about with the oak. And we don't notice them because all we do is look over the tops of them to that other path going off in a different direction. And we see all these people enjoying the splendor and sights as they walk down that path. Those people are on the journey that was meant for them. You're on the path meant for you. But you miss out on the gift because you spend your time believing that the gift is at the end. It becomes a commute instead of an adventure. And if we're not careful, our whole life becomes a commute. And we end up with road rage. <laughs> and everyone else's path starts looking better than ours. And we're not journeying with who God brought to us. We're comparing. We start tripping and stumbling over stuff. Because we're not taking in the details of our own path. We're searching elsewhere. I like what John Eldridge says in his book, Wild at Heart. Healing doesn't come outside of intimacy with Christ. Ooh, that hit me hard. By his stripes, we are healed. His body broken for us, his plans, his path, his journey. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. That's my favorite verse, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Your health is not hopeless. You are not headed for disaster. Your future is not bleak. You are not a failure. Being on a journey means sometimes you're tired, sometimes you fall, sometimes you grumble because you wish you were on that other path. But don't miss the gift. Don't try to do it alone. Put one foot in front of the other and smell the flowers along the way. So what does he have planned for you for 2018? What callings or gifts has he given you for the body of Christ? Ask him, what does your health journey look like right now? But what is his plan for your journey? What fears have enslaved you in the past? Where do you feel you've failed and you can't ever get back to a place of wellness? I'm going to take you back with me one more time to a piece of my journey 
And I'm going to read one more post from my blog that I wanted to share with you all. And then I'm going to ask you to join me in a song. And I am not a singer. So I'm not going to be singing the song. <laughs> but I'm hoping that someone else is going to be helping you sing this song. Sandra's got my back. Oh, she's pointing at you, Christy. You're helping me. <laughs> no, you don't need to. <laughs> so I want you um, to really digest and think about the lyrics to this song when I'm finished. And I really believe you're going to have some revelations throughout the conference tomorrow as we journey together and we partner with him. And this post that I'm going to read to you is titled, Did You Have to Ask? Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. That's John 16, 24. So why? Why we ask? For the majority of my life, I thought that I was not being submissive to God's plan when I asked why. I thought it rude, like back talking, as if I didn't trust God enough with my life. What I've come to find out, especially during these particularly difficult times of uncertainty and affliction, is not that I am not allowed to ask, but that when I ask, it brings about a time for learning from a loving father, the most loving there is because he is love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 John 4, 8. My boys ask me why a lot. Oftentimes it's when they are reluctant to do them, to do what I tell them to do. So most times I reply with a stern, just do what I ask you to do. <laughs> but I've come to realize that when my children ask why, it is an opportunity for not only them to learn, but for myself to learn as well. Paul D. Tripp says it so simply in his book, Parenting. Like our children, we are in need of a father who will patiently work over a long period of time to help us to see. We need a father who, in mercy, will not demand instantaneous change. We need a father who understands our condition and confronts us not just with rebuke, but with his grace. And although you are an adult and have perhaps known God for years, you still have pockets of spiritual blindness in you and still tend to resist the care that you need. Like our children, you and I do the same wrong things over and over again because we are not only blind, but we are blind to our blindness. We need compassionate, patient care if we are ever going to change, and so do our children. Ask any school teacher, and they'll tell you one of the best ways to learn is to ask questions. I recently came across a children's book by Linda Granfield titled Amazing Grace, the story of the hymn, about a man named Captain John Newton. He eventually realized that his blindness brought him to the bottom of the ocean, but the grace of God lifted him from the depths and opened his eyes to see. He was a slave trader for nearly 30 years, traveling by ship from England to West Africa and then on to the West Indies to deliver his cargo. During the 1750s, he wrote many entries into his journal about the horrendous conditions aboard the boat, confined to a space of about 30 inches on the lower deck, chained to one another, crowded into disease and waste. The only time any slave was taken to the top deck was to be splashed with cold water. 
Babies born during the trip and the deceased were thrown overboard. The women were repeatedly victimized and separated from the men and children. And John Newton was actually enslaved himself as a teenager on a lime plantation in Sierra Leone, but despite his experience, continued into the business of slave trade. In 1748, his why question opened his eyes to profound revelation. He asked, what mercy can there be for me? As a violent storm begins to rip apart his ship, he was headed for the bottom. And he writes, I thought if the Christian religion was true, I could not be forgiven and was therefore expecting and almost at times wishing to know the worst of it. He had come to know a revelation that he was blind to his blindness. Years later, John Newton was called into ministry, ordained, and appointed curate of a parish church in England. He was a powerful speaker, and it was during this time that he penned a book of hymns. Newton's Hymn 41 was titled, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. John condemned his past life and worked to stop the slave trade in his later years. He died in the same year Britain abolished the slave trade. I now believe the question why directed at God is an invitation to learning the depth and the width of his love. Our questions may or may not be answered but the point of the why is an opportunity for instruction and reflection. In Psalm 77, it reads, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. And when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. These verses are followed specifically by questions. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? The psalm writer remembers the love and faithfulness of his God in verses 10 through 12. Then I thought, to this I will appeal the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. We ask, and he invites us to join him for a walk of remembrance and testimony. A stroll down memory lane. I think we feel the need to come up with an answer for the difficult whys. Maybe there are some we have explanations for, but there are far more we do not. And in these circumstances, I think we need to not try to dole out answers as if we are still only under the law. But remember his works, testify to his goodness, and then reflect upon the life he lived as God's own son that gave us the only chance we'd ever have of living a grace-covered life. Lisa Bevere writes in her book, Lioness Arising, people that have no purpose, they argue about what is permissible and what is not permissible. She goes on to expound upon it in her curriculum video about how a tweet she posted on Twitter may have caused her to see the why question in a new light. One week she posted that 50 to 150 million women have gone missing from our earth. I looked it up and it was really actually closer to 113 to 200 million women. Due to violence against women, that, 
that violence would include selective abortion, genocide, food and medical neglect, honor killings and dowry death, sex trade, domestic violence, genital mutilation, and the list continues. So she received just 35 responses from a statement she thought would outrage her followers. Another week, she posted a question about whether women in ministry should wear or not wear sleeveless tops during a speaking engagement. She received 450 passionate responses about sleeves. I believe we could all greatly benefit from adding a little three-letter question word to our prayers and our responses and be comfortable with the fact that it doesn't always need to be answered, but it needs to be there. It is an inquiry that leads to research and research leads to revelation, but revelation is not always the answer to the original inquiry. Growth comes from acting on that revelation. So when my boys ask why, as an actual relevant question, or maybe just to test my patience a little, I'm going to do my very best to look at it as an opportunity to show them a father's compassionate, patient care from one blind soul to another. So why? Why has God sent you here to healthy you? He's got plans for you. And it's okay to ask that question. It's okay to say, but why? Why is this happening to me? Because he wants to talk to you about that. And he may not send you the answer to what you think you're asking. But he's sending you an answer. It's just not always in the form that you think it should come. But any time we spend time with God, any time we increase that intimacy with him, it always leads to revelation. Always. Always.